Welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. You can find more information on the website svos.org. Our guest, Joyce Savory, began her artistic life as a poet but now she creates beautiful artwork using collage, watercolor, and acrylic painting to express her emotional reactions to life. So welcome, Joyce. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about how you began painting. Well, I had written, and poetry was really my main love, and I still write, but I, in the process of writing in the 80s, I got so much in my head with the line breaks and with finding the right word, hours and hours would go by. I just got so much in my head, I thought I was going to float away. Okay. So I actually picked up the brush to sort of ground myself, to actually feel my feet on the ground, and um, it was sort of an act of salvation. And I found that everything that I had learned about the creative process in writing also right. pertained to painting. Oh, interesting. So your paintings are similar to poetry? Well, I, I hope so. It's like somehow the, the process, um, you, you need to learn the technical parts of writing. You need to learn the technical right. parts of painting, what to do with the canvas, what to do with the paint, how to get a beautiful green or uh, a colorful black, for example. Same thing with words. There's much of the technical part you have to, but then there, there comes that leap where you have to kind of forget about all the technical part and you kind of go from the inside, I think. Right. And so those things certainly are parallel. Interesting. So yeah. did you have any influential teachers? Did you learn anything that helped you make the transition into painting? Oh, many, many t teachers. Um, there's wonderful classes all over the Bay Area. Somebody said, oh, you have to go to Stanford to, to get a good teacher. It's not true. I'm telling you, they're at the Pacific Art League, at the Palo Alto Cultural Center. Uh, there's classes in the community centers. Uh, and if you you don't find a teacher in one place you don't, you don't like, then you go to someplace else. It's just a wealth of information and wonderful artists and wonderful teachers in this area. So you've been taking classes for a I've while. I've taken classes for years. I haven't taken any recently. Right. But when I first started in the 80s, yes, Palo Alto Cultural Center, the Pacific Art League, the Foothill. Uh, Excellent. Workshops. Santa Clara Valley Watercolor Society has just tons of uh, workshops and wonderful opportunities. So. Yet, so you have a very philosophical bent on art. You think a lot about your art, and when you talk about your art, um, it's very philosophical. Where does that come from? How do you present that in your paintings, do you think? You know, I, I'm not exactly sure. I think, um, I think meaning is very important for right. me. Some people feel like that's really not important, and they're more geared toward the technical end. I just find that things have to have a meaning before I do it. And um, so I think that's part of it. It just comes because I, I, I'm not going to spend my time at things I'm not interested in. So, right. so the subject has to be meaningful to me. If I'm going to work with collage, I'm going to take pieces of paper that have meaning, a, a, a card catalog card, because I love to read. It's going to be a picture of something. It's not usually going to be just random. So do you start with an overall idea of the meaning of what the painting is going to be, or does that develop as you go along? Both. There are mm -hmm. times when you know more of what it is you want to say, and then there's other times where the painting just runs away, and it becomes <laughs> like a Rorschach. You are exploring as you go, and it tells you where it wants to go. And sometimes it's through accidents. I mean, I, I believe that's one of the things that I think one of the teachers along the way said, to follow your accident. You don't always have to follow your intuition or, or the plan you had at the beginning. Sometimes you need to follow the accident. Well, for example, what do you mean? What kind of an accident are you talking about? Oh, with watercolor. That's oh. the most exciting because when you've, you've got the water, and especially when you're working wet on wet, 
people always say, oh, watercolor, that's the hardest because you have to have such control. But the water, uh, you, a lot of water right. paintings and the, the, the medium, you can't control at all. And it's very exciting to see where the water goes sometimes. And then let it just dry and see what happens and work with that. Interesting. Oh, it can make for some beautiful soft edges. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I know. That's a very interesting idea. So accidents in art. Yes. Well, you brought some images of collages that you've made and showing that technique in your artistic development. So let's take a look at those now. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is um, art life. It could be art slash life. Um, it's one of the collages. I was still working with a cup at that time. The cup is uh, in maybe about 50 of my paintings. Um, my dad had a coffee shop. We made egg coffee every morning. So... Um, the cup is there. This is my sort of statement about how art can separate you from you from life a little bit too. The 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 woman's got a book on her lap and uh, a pencil in her left hand. She's got her right hand raised. The spotted image is supposed to be a dog up there, and oh, I see that. she's yeah. not touching the dog. And it's just part of that. Um, the hard part of art is that you you. Get, you have to isolate yourself lots right. of time. The studio is a, can be a lonely place, and uh, you have to love it. You have to love being by yourself. So um, you're removed, you're working with life, but sometimes you do have to distance yourself from, from life itself. This is the piano lesson. This is another collage. Um, the piano is one of my favorite subjects. Um, I've made many piano paintings, and the piano lesson, I guess, historically has been done by so many artists. I think of Romare Bearden's, I think of right. Matisse, there's, you just go on and on. So this, again, has the dog in the center, and, uh, and this is one of feelings, feelings towards the piano. Um, I have one black hand, one white hand. I think I was listening to Thelonious Monk a lot at that time, <laughs> playing nice. the piano. And the it looks piano, very jazzy. yeah, is fraught with, you know, people love it, and there's a lot of anxiety sometimes too with the piano lesson, with the teacher. Right. So yeah. you're performing. Yes. How much did you practice? <laughs> <laughs> Never enough. This, the readers in internal life, is uh, one of those paintings when I said Rorschach um, that came. Uh, I started putting down the papers and. Um, gluing them and painting and then gluing and then painting on top of it and uh, all of a sudden I saw that snout. Uh, I consider that the man there as an animal um, with the open book and uh, so I love this painting because I feel like it was given to me. Uh, the woman on the right has her legs out. They're both in their books. I don't know if they're inside or outside. Um, I just know that they're together, they know they're together, and I have a feeling they love each other very much. And, um, but it's a quiet time together. Yeah, a quiet time where they're in their own worlds, but together. Yeah. That's a beautiful painting. So it's like finding, uh, uh, and this is the same thing, sometimes you find the painting like looking at clouds, uh, trying to find the animals in them, or uh, you see shapes. So this is Walt Whitman. This is uh, a collage as well. And he's um, a poet. And Walt Whitman is one of my favorite grand poets. I didn't really understand him, I don't think, till I was in my 40s. And uh, so, oh, he's just just marvelous. Well, this is another one that I painted, uh, uh, collaged. Yeah. It, there's writing in there. And I, I said, what? who the heck is that guy with the white beard? At first I thought it was Santa Claus. And then as I worked more and more, it came to me, no, this is Walt. This is my Walt Whitman. And um, and Walt reading Walt, actually. It I, looks it very glowing, like morning light, or that you could be like in a glowing window. Very, it's, mm. I love the colors in this one. Thank you. Very different from the darker pieces that you had before. Mm -hmm. This is N from the Not War series. Uh, I did six of these. They are, they could have been posters, but I ended up framing them all. Each one, there are six, the N-O-T-W-A-R, it was prior to the Iraq invasion, and um, it was my anti-war statement. Um, 
it's sort of hard to tell in this picture, but there is a huge N that covers the whole surface from left to right, and it's full of N words like negotiate, uh, oh, nebulae, uh, so, North Star. So this is where your poetry really works with your painting, so that there's poetry on the painting. Well, there's word. Yes, words. The, the words. The words are so important. Our our language is so important, and uh, I think we do have to fall in love with words and um, respect them because that's how I I feel that we're going to save ourselves as a people and as a nation. We have to learn how to speak with our enemy. It's, I I like the fact that it's part of a sentence and that there are words in the painting itself as well. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, and I really like, it seems to go off into the, into the distance and very nice painting. So you, you have a demonstration for us about how you do your collage techniques. Yes, well, so at, let's take a look at that now. Yeah, at Open Studios, one of the most common questions that, are uh, one frequent questions I get asked is, well, what do you use when you glue? I mean, it seems obvious when you've done it for years and years, but people really don't know. Uh, do I use Elmer's glue or, or is that legitimate? It's not acid free. So, um, so I thought I would just show some different um, examples of how to put paper on paper, the variety of fabrics on paper, and then what I do use. And I'm going to tell you that um, what I have here, and you can buy it in a variety of different stores, is matte medium. Now, you don't have to buy a gallon jug. You can get it in small little jars and experiment. But the matte medium is what I use for the thin paper, tissue papers. Um, if you're going to use something from the phone book, you'd want to use something like matte medium. You can see how it pours here. So it's very liquidy. liquidy. Yeah. Almost like a heavy cream. And then for the thicker papers, I use uh, a gel. And you can get matte gel, super gel. Um, but it is a gel, and you can see that's almost like paste. That's more like pudding. And does this that, is like thick cream, and this is like pudding. And it dries clear, even though it starts out white. It does. It dries clear. And that's the same as varnish. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But so I always have the these two setting out because you don't know exactly. You've got your t your papers here. So let's say I'm going to use something like this. I could put this on the other side maybe too, because it'll show up a little better. Um, and you don't use your good brushes. You never use your good brushes. These are from Ikea. They're cheap. They're, you can get them at the hardware store. They're bristle brushes. And it's good to have different sizes. So on something like phone, phone, uh, something from a phone book that's very thin. This has also got some printed blue from um, doing some um, ink prints. You want to do the whole surface. Let's say I'm going to let this one show. So you want to make sure you cover the whole surface and especially the edges. So hopefully you're going to do it on something that um, is important. I'm going to do it right on this one right here. You do all the edges and you have to get every single inch because if you leave a part, you'll get bubbles in the middle and oh. that will raise and that um, you'll wish you hadn't done that. So just get it over the whole thing. Let's see. Um, like I say, I think it's work good to work with papers that have meaning for you. I love music. Let's put in some piano music. This is also thin. So we'll put it right on top, overlap it, and I do one on the bottom, one on the top. If you have special paper that you don't want to get any glue on the, on the other side, um, I'm trying to think of when, you, well, if you were working with your own watercolor paper, you may not want to do that. Then you'd only do it, obviously, one side. And when I'm thinking about watercolor, I want to tell you that it re makes it really interesting when you work with collage to, to tear things versus cut them. It's so interesting to see this little white edge. And then it's also good to do it um, so you don't get the edge. And I forget how you do it. Yeah, you just tear it the other way, and you have no white. 
So it's good to make it varied. Sometimes mm -hmm. the white, sometimes just the blue. It depends upon what, what you want in that spot. And that paper is thicker. This is thicker. So I'm going to switch from this glue to the uh, more paste-like matte gel. Again, the whole thing, and make sure you get the edges. Because if you don't get the edges also, they can be the part that tends to pop up. Now, if you want texture, or big texture, or if you want that pop-up, go ahead and do it. But just know that, it, that your edges might curl. So we've got, and I picked this up yesterday. I was thinking, I don't know if you saw in the uh, paper today, but they're talking about um, the Bay Bridge being deconstructed now. And they're going oh, yeah. to use parts of it for art, which is really exciting, because it looks like a rector set. Oh, yeah, when you the think old of, Bay Bridge, not the new one. <laughs> Yeah, the old, the old <laughs> Bay Bridge, right. So I thought, oh, how exciting, because I've seen some, uh, I have some paper in my uh, studio with a rector set, you know, with Childs. Well, this is a tinker toy, but it made me think of it. So if I were working on this piece, then I would, historically, this would be meaningful because I'd say that was the day that I read about how the Bay Bridge was going to be used for art, that they were going to... So each piece hmm. in the collage has meaning as well as the whole collage itself. That's, that's yeah. great. I, th I think it's helpful to do that. I, I, to, for me, it is important. And then when you're placing the items, does that have meaning as well, where they are next to each other? Well, it'll depend. And uh, to begin with, oftentimes not so, because some of it, a lot of it may be painted over. I, with the collage, it's a lot of layer work where you'll work, you'll um, paint, you'll collage, you'll paint. So you don't know... How, how much of any only you know what's inside here only you know the rector set maybe is in here part of the bridge is in here so wider wider if you've got huge pieces and also the other thing um, a lot of people will use is uh, and that I like is to use an actual old uh, credit card if you're going to do a large piece what does that do it you put the glue on with it because it makes it really flat a lot of people do their uh, gesso with a credit card as well because it's uh, very smooth, it's fast. Again, the edges. I'm just going to put it down like this. Now, after you get some of them down, you need to flatten it at, at the moment. And some people use a brayer. I sometimes use a brayer, depends upon, but you're going to have to have something that doesn't stick to it to flatten. If it's a small space, if it's larger, you can use a rolling pin. That'll work. Is that white paper on top a special type of paper? This is the, um, this is a non-stick surface. It's like wax paper. You can use butcher paper. Um, there's a variety. This actually I had a peel off, uh, layer and I grabbed it from some paper store and they gave it to me. So this that's what and the other way is just using your hands which is very pleasurable actually to flatten just with your hand because you start to feel kind of the warmth of the painting. So okay so then after you've got your your collage on what if you're going to flatten the whole You're going to put a clean piece of non-stick. I've got a board down here. Your collage goes face down. And this has got to be clean because this is going to be your art piece here. This goes here. You're going to put another board on top that night. This is at the end of the day or in the middle of the day if you're, if you're done for a while. You put the board there and then you pile it with books. And use every book you've got, every dictionary, the old encyclopedias. I might have 20 books piled on top. And then in the morning when you come back, it's so exciting. You take them all off. You uh, look at your painting. It's dried. It's flat. And uh, all the edges hopefully are flat. And you end up with, you know, almost like a, a painted piece because it's flat. And you don't have all those edges and you, everything is glued down. And the best way is to, is to use this system. And every square inch of this would be covered with books. So it all is flat. Yeah. So I'd say 10 books, at least 10, 15 books. And I always have a stack that uh, I use just for this very purpose.
Well, that's great. Just for piling them on. So that so, can also be used with watercolor. You know, you can. So you uh, brought some images things. of paintings, watercolors, and acrylics. So let's take a look at those now. Yes. Okay. So this one is the old upright. This is one of the beginning of the piano series. And um, I, I took a course with Mike Bailey, uh, um, Painting Beyond the Obvious, and um, where you do 20, 25 paintings on large watercolor uh, sheets of paper. So this is one of my, I chose the piano because I love the piano. And uh, if I were gonna, was going to make 20 paintings, I wanted to certainly have something that was of interest to me. So, um, and the old upright is something that has, uh, that I grew up with at home. And it's, this is what my piano looks like today. So it's and then Song at Twilight, this is another from that series. This one, the lighting is more important. Uh, the light that sits on top of the piano is almost as important as the keys itself. Um, it's just that, I, kind of that golden glow at twilight is what I yeah, thought about the piano. And it seems like it's even more ethereal than the one before. Uh. Oh, look Then, at that. Wow. towards about the 20th painting or 22nd, they became more abstract. The, the more pianos I made, the uh, less defined, the less hard edges. Um, and so this, I call jazz the blues. Um, because it is less defined, it's wet on wet, and um, quite is, bright. Is this part of the accidents that you were talking about, with the drips of paint dripping down? It looks almost like the music is flowing off of the keys. Yeah, well, that's the thing, is that I remember I was painting this on the floor. I do a lot of painting on the floor, and I had this set up on the edge. This was the first drip painting I made. And uh, it started there with this. And um, so, yes, it definitely is uh, one where the accidents, I, I started it and then it was finished before I, I thought it was. It was. That's beautiful. Thank you. So this, you would say, most people wouldn't recognize this as a piano, but this is like the 24th, 25th piano because the, the piano itself, I got so into the music and the rhythm of music and what I love about music, and it came out in the physical sense of uh, the writing itself, the rhythm of our bodies. It's almost like a heartbeat. And it, the, the writing had been in the background, like in End Not War and many of the paintings, um, in the layers the writing had been. This is the first where the writing became the subject. And this is when we think of them, Fields of War. This is another of my anti-war uh, paintings. And um, the writing is, in the, is there, but, and it is the subject. The cows were um, added afterwards. Uh, I had a series of uh, anti-war paintings with calla lilies at one of the open studios. My son, Jake, was helping me get ready for it. And he, um, I said, I'm not sure if I should be doing uh, labeling it as an anti-war. I, I don't know if I should um, acknowledge that. And he said, and he was only 16 at the time, and he said, you have to stand behind your work, Mom. And um, oh, so he, he made a sign for the studio. He said, where have all the flowers gone? And um, I learned a lot that day. The Working Woman is one of the paintings I've begun to, um, part of my later series where I have fabric and um, writing together. And you can barely see the woman. Oh, this one's interesting. That's and very collaged. This also, this is collaged as well. And the other, there wasn't actually a woman in the other one. It's just the idea of, of the, uh -huh. the rags. There's a lot of actual rags. And I'm <laughs> thinking of, uh, uh, I know rags well. And uh, this is from the Stanford series. I worked as a nurse at Stanford for 35 years. And, so what uh, is the medium here? This is acrylic. Oh. This is acrylic Very now. watery, though. Interesting. Yes. Well, I think that's the influence of the watercolor, yeah. is that it's natural. It's natural for me to use the acrylic this way. So I did, I, this is part of a series, I think I have 12 of these. And it's the, the flowers that I see every morning in the spring between the parking lot and the hospital. 
and I, I've always wanted to paint them. After I did the white on white series, it was a breath of fresh air for me to work with color again. I was hungry for color. And then this is another one, Stanford Wildflowers um, 8. Uh, again, just the field of walking through, the feel of walking through the flowers is what I wanted to pick up here. I, I don't have wildflowers like that in my yard. I, I <laughs> no. love they're beautiful. The, oh, it's just such a surprise when they come. Yeah. And this is Mantia by the Bay. This is, uh, um, has the writing in the background right. in the layers again. And um, it's often a poem by Tron Stromer that will be in the paintings, a particular poem, uh, Allegro, which has to do with music. But I've written it over and over and over about 50 times in my paintings. And uh, again. The same poem? The same poem because oh, I just I just never get tired of that the graphic and the physical part of writing after a black day I play Haydn and feel warmth in my hands. It's just the keys are ready. That's beautiful. Kind hammers fall. So oh, uh, I really like the way you incorporate the words in your paintings and it really represents the poetry that you started with and it continues on although it's very visual now as opposed to we don't read your poems out loud anymore. We see them. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your future plans. Where can we see your art in person? Well, my art is at uh, the studio shop in Burlingame on Primrose Lane. And uh, I have art at Gallery House in Palo Alto on California Avenue. And uh, through Art Liaison, that's kind of throughout the peninsula with Gail Shohan. And uh, those are the three main places. Well, those are great places in the Bay Area. You're sort of spread out a little bit. Yeah, I feel very fortunate. Yeah, to that's great. Have that. So, well, thank you so much for being here on Talk Art with us. Your art is absolutely beautiful and fascinating to hear about your philosophy. And so thank you very much. Well, thank and you. Thank you for watching Talk Art. Thank you, Zelle. <laughs>